We talk a lot here at Nomad Capitalist about the benefits of owning foreign real estate for higher returns, higher probability investments, and just general diversification. But in this video, I'm going to answer one particular age-old question. Is it better to own property in your own personal name or in a corporate structure or trust? Hey guys, I'm Andrew Henderson, and if you want to learn more about how Nomad Capitalists can help you legally reduce your taxes, invest in foreign markets, and become a global citizen, learn more about how we can help at nomadcapitalist.com. Now let's talk about this interesting question. When you're buying real estate overseas, how do you title that? Okay. Now I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to give you a one-size-fits-all answer. Sometimes people come and say, just say yes or just say no. Obviously, with hundreds of different countries and territories out there, I can't give you an answer, but I am going to give you a four-point test that you can apply to your own situation to get an answer or get some more clarity in the situation. Now, one thing I see in, in helping people directly is some people just have general confusion about this issue, and some people um, are just concerned about the issue, and I'll tell you what that means. In the United States, for example, where I come from, you have a very litigious culture, and people are suing you, you know, they slip and fall on your sidewalk, uh, and they're going to come after you for millions of dollars. Now, obviously, insurance can solve that, but one thing people have done to add an extra layer of insurance is generally investment properties in the U.S. are held in an LLC, a limited liability company. So that way, uh, some people will put in just, just one property per LLC. You have 20 properties, 20 LLCs. Or, you know, they'll say, hey, the three in this neighborhood have their own LLC, and so therefore only those assets can be attached in the event of some kind of litigation. The issue that I generally walk people through, in particular, uh, Americans when they're with me and we're looking at foreign property is a lot of markets don't have those litigation issues and so that's not as important. Now on the other side of the coin you have folks who are very concerned that you know I want to hide my property ownership or you know I want to uh, you know be protected in terms of certain government actions or or other stuff and so I want to put my, my property in a trust and, and sometimes it's I want to have a trust that owns a company that owns another company I think it's very easy to get carried away. Number one, we don't talk about hiding assets here. Now, for U.S. citizens in particular, you can own assets uh, in terms of foreign real estate overseas. Those are not reportable. The income is, but the asset itself is not reportable. Um, and so the other issue is I've seen cases where someone owns a property in one country in a foreign trust. The government in the country where the property is says, we don't care for this foreign trust. We're taking it or we're awarding it to this guy. Right? So that's the challenge with real estate, in my opinion, is you have to feel comfortable with the government where the property is. And by the way, most of those cases have been in the United States where I've seen that. Um, so I don't know how a foreign trust necessarily solves a lot of objectives. I think there's a certain sexiness, you know, this kind of like, you know, let's make things needlessly complicated among some people. Um, but those are two different sides of the coin that I often see, the confusion and then folks who are just worried I, I don't think that either of those things are relevant because when you're investing in property overseas, you have to understand that markets are different. One way they're different is litigation. And again, if you're worried about certain things, there may be certain things that a trust or a, or a Byzantine corporate structure won't solve. Now, let's talk about my four-point test. Call it COTI, if you will. Complexity, operating costs, taxes, and immigration. Okay, so we've already spoken a little bit to the complexity. That's the C. Is is having more complexity going to make your life easier or harder? And is it going to solve any problems or provide appropriate insurance in relation to the level of complexity that it's creating? Okay. So, um, you know, is having a trust that owns a property, does that protect you anymore? Now, from an asset protection standpoint, litigation, that kind of thing, maybe. It just might. It might not in other cases. Okay. The O is operating costs. A complex structure is going to cost more to operate. A company is generally going to cost more to operate. Let me give you an example. Okay, I have a property in Montenegro. If you want to own a property uh, in Montenegro in a company, uh, there may be certain tax implications, but what there certainly will be is you have a company and it's, it's, it's just a regular company. There's really not a distinction between a trading company that's selling widgets and a company that's designed to own a property. And so, that company that owns a property, you as the director of that company are going to, need, are going to have to pay yourself a director's salary. Okay? 
that salary is going to be subject to tax, including social taxes. Now, that minimum salary is pretty low. It's something like 300, 400 euros a month. The taxes are 1,000 euros or a little bit more every year. But you also get to file ongoing reports. Okay? You have a company, right? What's the status for the company? Accounting reports. You have to have an accountant to do that. You have to pay the tax. That's a lot of work. That adds cost. It also adds complexity, by the way. Okay? Also, you can own a property to accomplish I'm not entirely sure what in that particular country. Okay, so operating costs are going to be higher. Now, you can certainly have other offshore companies that own properties. Those may not always be accepted in a certain country. So, you know, if you go to a lot of countries, uh, they may want you to use uh, to own your property only in a domestic company. And so then you'd have to have the offshore company, you'd have to have a subsidiary that's local underneath. Now you've got, again, more complexity. And now you've got the higher operating cost of two different companies, okay? So companies, corporate structures, trusts, they always add cost. I'm not saying don't add cost. I'm not about cheaping out at all. Uh, what I am about is saying, let's avoid needless costs. Sometimes people will come to me and I'll say, hey, you know what, I'd recommend you spend more for this, but let's not have some you know, five-part hydra that we need to feed with startup costs, monthly costs, annual filing costs, registered agent costs, company secretary costs, you know, costs, costs, costs. Listen, Someone who's in the business of selling companies or selling trusts, their goal is to get a lifetime customer, right? You know, every year, every month, every quarter, whatever, they're gonna keep charging you more and more fees. In fact, that's why a lot of them charge low fees to start because once they get you in, they figure they're just gonna keep charging you. So their goal is to sell you as many companies and trusts as they possibly can. When it comes to real estate, again, complexity is often higher. Operating costs are almost certainly gonna be higher using that kind of structure. And in addition, even in countries where you can use that foreign company to own property, you might have to register it, you might have to pay fees, you might have to have a lawyer go and do it for you if you're not in the country physically, you need things like power of attorney. Um, so even when it does work, it does add a layer of complexity and cost. The third part is taxes, okay? Here's the thing to understand about corporate structures. In many countries, especially those with more simple tax codes, which is theoretically what we're aiming for here, um, corporate tax rates could be higher. Corporate structures could have fewer incentives or fewer reductions of tax that ordinary individual landlords would have if you're renting the property out. Let me give you one example from, from Georgia. Okay. Corporate structure. Now they have a kind of the Estonia model now where you can theoretically defer tax in perpetuity and pay 0% and therefore compound your money. But eventually the tax bill is going to come due and it's going to be around 20%. Uh, in a corporate structure. On the other hand, an individual landlord pays 5% tax um, on most uh, residential properties. Okay? In some countries, if you own a property uh, in uh, a corporate structure and you sell it, the capital gain, or in some cases, in very rare cases, the entire value of the property could be subject to corporate tax. On the other hand, individuals generally have more exemptions for selling a property and, and avoiding capital gains tax in some countries, even if it's not your primary residence. So you hold a property for two, three, five years, you sell it as an individual person, uh, you can often uh, get either a reduction or an elimination of capital gains tax, whereas in a corporate structure, much more difficult because the corporate rules apply, especially if you're coming from a country like the U.S. where you're used to LLCs. The LLC is a very interesting kind of hybrid model. It's not really a corporation. I mean, it's not a corporation, right, By under, in the U.S. standard. But on the global level, it's not a corporation. It's not really the same thing. And so the LLC is a very interesting hybrid that kind of, you know, doesn't really make things any more complicated. Other countries don't always have that. And so if you're, if you're coming from the United States, you're used to LLCs, you're not going to find that same thing in many countries. And so you're going to end up paying more tax. I told the story before about how I used a corporate structure once, and I ended up having to pay VAT on the sale of the property. Why? Simple tax code. Real estate's not exempt from VAT if you're not selling to a real estate uh, or to a VAT payer. Okay, and so I ended up, you know, having to pay five or $6,000 out of my profit in VAT on this, on this small deal because I had it in a corporate structure. Okay? The big thing that I want you to understand when you're buying property overseas, because I've made mistakes, right? I don't have some secret sauce where I'm just immune from ever making mistakes. The way I don't make mistakes is I just do a lot of deals and I just get in there and do it and then I just tell you what happened and I tell you what to avoid. But if you think that property overseas works the same way as property in your own country, you're gonna be disappointed and you're gonna get yourself into some of these problems. Okay? So taxes are an issue. In a corporate structure, you'll often pay a higher rate of um, tax on income. 
Income may be subject to VAT. You'll generally pay more on capital gains. Uh, when you sell the property, you'll have fewer exemptions, uh, and you may even pay VAT on the sale of the property. The fourth uh, bullet point to be aware of is immigration. Now, not everyone who's buying real estate overseas is buying it for an immigration benefit. However, I think real estate is a great way, if you're going to be investing, it's a great way to take advantage of certain residence programs, permanent residence programs, fast track naturalization programs, what I call get paid to get a passport. We've got a video on that, uh, as well as citizenship by investment. Now, citizenship by investment real estate is generally not good, although uh, in Turkey right now they have a deal where you can buy any real estate uh, that you want and qualify for citizenship. Other countries have programs that take a little bit while longer, two years, three years, five years, but buying real estate is the basis for getting yourself uh, residence and possibly citizenship in the future. And so there's no uniform standard here, but generally what I found is owning property in your own name is a lot easier for immigration and sometimes required. Uh, so here's the thing about understanding about immigration. Don't make the bureaucrat's life any more difficult, okay? Many of them are not that smart. So you want to make it as easy on yourself as possible. You go to a bureaucrat, I'm applying for my golden visa in a European country or my permanent residence in some other country, whatever the case may be. Here's my name, here's the property, you know, it's in my name, here's my passport. This is easy for me to understand, they say. This I know, I see Andrew, I see Andrew. Okay, I can handle this. Oh, I see Andrew and I see, you know, Shell Company Holdings Limited owned by a Jersey Trust with a nominee. To, uh, this is, uh, you know, I'm going to lunch. But you've only been here for five minutes. I know I'm going to lunch. Oh, okay, I'll be back for that coffee break. Don't make their life any more difficult. For immigration purposes, if your goal is to move to the country, um, keep it simple. Um, because you're just going to cause yourself needless hassle. Uh, by putting it in some other name. And again, they may not let you. There are some cases where they'll let you put it in a corporation, but you have to show the paperwork, you have to show the 100% ownership, you've got to do a bunch of different documents. It goes back to the complexity piece. Keep it simple, okay? So those are four things to keep in mind when you're buying real estate in new markets. I'm not saying there aren't situations where a corporate structure or a trust doesn't work or isn't called for. One thing that sometimes it's almost required for U.S. citizens who have earnings inside of a foreign company that they can't take out as readily without being heavily taxed, is you almost need to use subsidiaries to invest in other markets to avoid you know, getting the U.S. tax hit. It's suboptimal on a global level, but it may actually be better on the U.S. level. So even though it's worse off than doing it as an individual, it may be better off because you're a U.S. citizen. So for U.S. citizens, always you want to do the proper planning when you're doing any kind of investments overseas. But those are my four criteria. What do you think? Which real estate markets are you interested in? Leave a comment below. I want to know what you think. How can Nomad Capitalist help you? Four ways. Number one, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to make sure you get our new video every day. Number two, get a copy of Nomad Capitalist, the book. You'll learn a lot of my personal experiences over a dozen years of studying this stuff, as well as exactly some of the strategies that you can use to build your Nomad Capitalist plan. Number three, if you're not sure where to start, but you want to come and learn from my team and I, you want to come and mingle with like-minded people, learn more about our live conference, Nomad Capitalist Live. It's coming up soon. And number four, if you want some help right now because you've got a burning issue, you need something solved, you want to lower your taxes, get a second passport, or build the Nomad Capitalist lifestyle of your dreams, go to nomadcapitalist.com and click on Become a Client.